Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. Some of you might have heard the true story about Chippy the parakeet. Poor Chippy. He never saw it coming. One second, Chippy was peacefully sitting in his cage. And then in a few moments of time, Chippy was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. You see, his problems all began when his owner decided to clean his cage with a vacuum cleaner. What could go wrong? She took the attachment from the end of the hose, and she stuck it in the cage, and then the phone rang. And so she turned to pick up the phone, and she had barely said hello when she heard this swoosh sound, which was the sound of poor Chippy getting just sucked right in. Well, the owner kind of gasped at this, so she just quickly put down the phone and turned off the vacuum cleaner. And she opened up the bag. It was one of those with a bag. And she opened it up, and sure enough, there was Chippy. He was still alive, but obviously a little bit stunned. Now, since the bird was covered with dust and soot and filth, all that you find in a vacuum cleaner, what did she do next? Well, she grabbed poor Jippy, and she ran to the bathroom as fast as she could, and she turned on the faucet full blast and held Jippy underneath the running water. Realizing a little too late that maybe that wasn't the smartest thing to do and that the water was very cold, she noticed that Jippy was not only soaked, but he was sitting there just kind of shivering. So out of compassion at this point for her bird, she reached for her hair dryer and blasted the poor bird with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who initially wrote about this event, she contacted the owner to see how the bird was recovering. And the owner of the bird replied, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. (laughs) He just sits and stares. Well, from the outside, looking in, many would dare to say that the church in Acts chapter 8 did not have a lot to sing about. Stephen, if you remember from our last study, had just been put to death. Good old Saul. Saul was making havoc of the church. Remember what scripture says, he was entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what did the church do? The church scattered. But instead of sitting in silence, what we read in verse 4 is that they continued to preach the word of God as they went. You see, the church, the church understood that even though persecution does come because of the world's absolute hatred for Jesus Christ, for the believer in Christ, oh, there is so much to sing about. There is so much for us to rejoice about. Philip, Philip stands before us as an excellent example of a man that understood that when those harsh winds blow, the command from the word of God remains the same. We must serve Christ. Amen. With verse 5, notice some of the careful wording from Luke, that Philip went down. It says in verse 5, he went down to the city of Samaria. Now, Samaria is, of course, to the north of Jerusalem. So it may seem strange to use the words that Philip went down to the city of Samaria. But remember, when you leave Jerusalem in any direction, you always go down from the city first because Jerusalem sits up on a ridge with the Temple Mount being at its highest point. So verse 5 teaches us that Philip went to the city of Samaria. This would actually be the capital city of Samaria, which had been rebuilt by Herod the Great. Some of the remains of the city are still with us to this day. It was the capital, if you remember from the Old Testament, it was the capital of the northern kingdom of the Jews before it was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. The Assyrian king, 
took most of the Jews captive. He just dragged them off out of there, leaving only the poorest people in the land to work the farms. And then what did he do? Well, he brought in a whole bunch of pagan people from all the surrounding nations. And these other people that came in, they intermarried with the Jews that were left, and the mixed race became known as the Samaritans. The people of the southern kingdom of Israel, they saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. There was intense hatred for one another. And the new people that settled in the land of the northern tribes, they looked at Yahweh as just one of many gods to worship. Second Kings actually teaches us that the people, they made shrines to their gods in the towns that they settled in. And so by the time you get to Acts, we have Hundreds and hundreds of years of hatred and history. Samaritans were the outsiders to the house of Israel, worshiping pagan gods with only a small minority seeking the Lord, but deeply, deeply confused in their faith. Isn't that the same thing we see today in the West? A small minority seeking the Lord, but deeply confused in their faith. Listen, some people were open to the gospel. Samaria was a mission field on the doorstep of Judea. Christ, if you remember from the gospels, Christ had ministered there. The apostles had been instructed not all that long ago to take the gospel there. And anyone that was left up in Samaria, who was a descendant of those old, old northern tribes, they still considered themselves to be the people of God. Yes, they had changed some of the scriptures, but they also did some positive things. They circumcised their sons. They had their own temple for a time. Not that they were supposed to, but they did. And they looked for a Messiah. Their worship of God was not pure, but the people of Samaria were a bridge, if you will, to the Gentile nations because a remnant did look for a Messiah. So here comes Philip. Philip went and he preached Christ to them. He saw their need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember who Philip was? In Acts chapter 7, he was one of the seven men chosen to serve the widows. And now he became the church's first missionary. So verse 6 in your text, it tells us that the people listened. They saw, they heard the miracles that were done through him. Let's understand this as we walk through the book of Acts. That most people... Let's make it more specific. Most believers, most Christians did not cast out demons or heal people in that day. Select men of God, along with the apostles, exercise these gifts to authenticate the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The miracles that were done before the lost, they were done to bring them to a place of understanding that, hey, this wasn't just some show and tell. This was God at work. The holy God, the one true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, was at work. So their hearts would be softened and receptive to the gospel message. And in this case, we also see that God used this to demonstrate to the people the difference between the power of Satan, and yes, the power of Satan is very real, and the power of God. So notice the work of God through Philip in verse 7. Read it with me in your Bibles. It says, For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Pay attention in this text to how the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks down the barriers of men. Demons, disease, fled before the power of God demonstrated through Philip. There was none of this, let's say it like this, there was none of this go home and claim your healing like we see men trying to sell in many churches today. Because when there was healing, men and women were healed right there and then. And don't miss in the scriptures how many times we see that demons were possessing men. You know, I think it still happens today. I'm sorry, I do. I think it still happens. But the only difference now today is that we put a psychological label on men or we medicate them instead of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Now, verse 8. Verse 8 inspires me. I hope it inspires you. Read it again. There was great joy in that city. The gospel. The gospel, it brings joy. I don't know about you, but I cried like a big old fat baby when I got saved back in 1993. I did. It brought joy. It's the release of the bondage of sin and the realization of eternal life, new life with the Savior, Jesus Christ. So watch how this unfolds now in Acts, starting with verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Who remembers Muhammad Ali? The boxing legend, the great boxing legend, Muhammad Ali. He used to shout, remember that? He used to shout at the TV cameras the words, I am the greatest of all time. But it looks like he stole those words, doesn't it? From this man, Simon. Because Simon used this catchphrase 2,000 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. Simon proclaimed himself as the greatest, but this was a dangerous man. Dangerous enough to give false hope to those without hope. He was the type of person that would do anything, absolutely anything, to get ahead of other people. He wanted people to put their faith in him instead of in the living God. He claimed to be the greatest, and the people, they just fed right into it. Skip down to the end of verse 10 for a second. Notice what the people said about him. This man is the great power of God. This man made the claim that he represented the very power of God. That's bold. Simon actually had quite the following. Here is where history can help us some. Even in the second and third centuries, there was a group that traced their beliefs back to this man named Simon. A second century historian reports that in the days of the early church, Simon was worshipped by most of the Samaritan people as the first God. And we also know that at one point in time, Simon made it up to Rome. He made it to the city of Rome, and even there he was worshipped as a God. They built a statue and put the words on the statue to the holy God, Simon. Archaeologists have uncovered statues of this man. He was worshipped by many. Pay attention to the contrast in the text. It's remarkable. Philip travels to Samaria. He preaches the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. He casts out demons. He heals the sick. Great joy was in that city. Great, great joy. And then with verse 9, the entire scene changes with one little word. But. Joy was in that city, but there was a man called Simon. Boy, it doesn't take much to throw a wrench in things, does it? One person is all it takes. Simon had the power of Satan. And Simon was confronted with the true power of God. You know, if you take the book of Acts and you think of everything that Satan had tried to do up until this point to try to stop the church of Jesus Christ from moving forward... Ananias and Sapphira, they had lied about money, right? There was a division in the church about how the widows were being treated. The murder of Stephen, persecution. But what do we see? We see the gospel. It just continued to go forth over and over again. And now you have this man, Simon, but his power did not come from God. I suspect that Satan was trying to get into the church. We know more about this man. Years later in Rome, it is said he was able to, like I said earlier, spread his lies to the church there. And he was actually able to incite the Roman government against the church of Christ. Simon traveled around with a slave woman by the name of Helen. And he claimed that she was the incarnation of the divine mind. And at the end of his life... It's reported that he tried to emulate the resurrection of Christ by having himself buried alive in Rome. He promised that he would rise again on the third day. But of course he didn't. And that was the end of good old Simon. 
But he had a gift, a satanic gift, if you will. A satanic gift that he used to mesmerize the people of Samaria. Simon claimed that God spoke to men through him. Simon claimed that God's power was manifest through him. But then Simon was confronted through Philip by the power of the living God. So watch again. Verse 11 says the people heeded him. They listened to him. They couldn't argue against his power. And when the truth of God is not present, people always turn to the counterfeits of the world. So pick it up with verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Pay close attention in this part of the text to the wording, to the careful wording by Luke as we go through this. In verse 12, we see that as Philip preached, the people believed what they heard, watch the wording, about the kingdom of God and about the name of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God refers to the coming messianic kingdom, which starts during the millennium, and the name of Jesus. That looks, of course, to his position as the Messiah, the Christ. In other words, here's what was being said. The message meant that some Samaritans would become heirs of the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, by faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, some people question in verse 12, did the people of Samaria accept the gospel of Christ at this point? Or did they wait until later on when they received the Holy Spirit? Boy, is there a lot of stuff going on here. Well, my answer is that what I read from Luke is that Philip preached Christ. Philip preached the gospel. And when we get to verse 17, we'll cover why the Spirit of God did not come into them right away. But the people, they believed the gospel and were baptized right away. They didn't wait. The people baptized right away after they believed. Baptism not for salvation, but obedience and identification with the word of God of that salvation. The words of verse 13. Notice the shocking words of verse 13. Simon also believed, and when he was baptized... Think of those simple words. Simon also believed. Now it's said by a lot of people that he could not have truly believed that his faith must have been spurious, that it wasn't genuine. If church history is correct, and church history is not inspired, is it? Church history is not inspired. But if church history is correct, his actions later on certainly did not honor Christ. But all I can tell you is that the Spirit of God led Luke to record here that Simon believed. And if you dig a little deeper and you look at the wording, the word means to trust. It means to put your faith in. Same wording as for the Samaritans believing back in verse 12. You either believe or you don't. And if words have meaning, Luke says he believed. He had faith, is literally what he's saying. I also know that Christians are more than capable of sin. Christians are capable of dishonoring the name of Christ. Christians are even able to oppose the work of Christ, especially new believers. Think back to your old salvation. Was it instant, perfect sanctification the minute you got saved? It wasn't for this bald boy, I'll tell you that. But something went wrong with Simon. Let's agree on that. Something went wrong with Simon. Sin had a hold of him. And ultimately, it comes down to God knows if there was faith. That's where we leave it. It's not a small thing, though, that Simon followed Philip, amazed at the miracles of God being done. And then with verse 14, the text shifts back to the apostles in Jerusalem. They had heard word about those in Samaria receiving the word of God. So they sent Peter and John, pick it up again in verse 15, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So here's a $50 million question, Michaela. Why? Why the delay? I mean, why? 
What is that about? Sometimes you got to ask those questions. Ask those questions as you're reading the Word of God. Why the delay? Why the delay in receiving the Spirit of God? It's not the normal pattern that you see in the book of Acts, is it? What we see most of the time is men and women responding to the gospel of Christ. Men and women receiving the Spirit of God immediately with these believers responding in obedience with baptism. Over in chapter 9, we see this with the Apostle Paul. He believed, he received the Spirit, and he was baptized. We see this once again in chapter 10 with Cornelius. But here we have the gospel being preached and accepted, baptism, and then a delay before receiving the Spirit of God. So what is going on, Grayson, with this text? Many in our day like to proclaim that this is a passage that teaches us a second blessing. Meaning, and what they're driving at with this is the idea that not every believer in Christ receives the Spirit of God at conversion. And we must ask after we get saved and pray for the Spirit of God after we're converted. That's inconsistent with the Word of God. The answer to this passage is actually given to us down in verse 16. Take a look again, once again, at the second half of the verse. They had only been baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. The contrast to this is the first part of verse 16, that the Spirit of God had not fallen on them. They had taken part in water baptism, but they had not been baptized by the Spirit of God. In other words, what I'm telling you is the very fact that Luke points out they had only received water baptism, it points us to the understanding that this was not the usual pattern. So listen closely. Luke was pointing out with the wording used as something unusual, something out of the ordinary was taking place. Clearly the Spirit of God was working on these men and women as they came to an understanding of the gospel of Christ. But something different was taking place. And even though the Spirit of God had pierced their hearts when they got saved at conversion, they had not been baptized with the Spirit of God empowering them to live for Christ. So, I still didn't answer your question though. Why? Why? Why the delay? Here's what we see in the Word of God. And I believe you need to know this if you want to understand the book of Acts. The pouring out of the Spirit of God, it took place in three distinct and separate phases. First would be the Jews in Jerusalem, recorded in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. The second would be the initial pouring out of the Spirit of God upon the Samaritans in our text right here in Acts chapter 8 before us. And the third act of God pouring out His Spirit will be coming up in chapter 10 as Cornelius and the Gentiles receive the Spirit of God. The Jews first, the Samaritans second, and then the Gentiles. And it would be all three times that God would use Peter He would use Peter all three times. Keep in mind, God was teaching the church something. There's a reason for this in the Word of God. You see, God was teaching the church that the Samaritans and the Gentiles did not need to become true Jews before they accepted the gospel of Christ. See, God was demonstrating this to the church by the reception of the Spirit of God. Let's think about it this way. If the Spirit of God would have first came to the Samaritans when Philip preached the gospel to them, if Peter and John had not come to Samaria to lay hands on them, then it would have been a separate, a completely separate experience from what happened in Jerusalem when the Spirit of God came upon the apostles. The Jews would have had their church over in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans would have had their church over in Samaria. And then hundreds of years of animosity and hatred between them would have just kept going and continued on and on. So Peter and John here are serving as a link or a demonstration that Christ's church is made up of one body. One body in Christ. Now this was a major step for the church. The pouring out of the Spirit of God and the signs and the wonders done through Philip demonstrated God working among the people of Samaria. And Paul, just for the record, he teaches us over in 1 Corinthians 12 that after the initial outpouring of the Spirit of God in the book of Acts, for us now, 
2,000 years later, every believer in Christ has received the Spirit of God. If you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of, of God. So Peter and John, back in our text here, they laid hands on the Samaritans in verse 17, identifying with them, Jews and Samaritans now, in one body of believers in Christ Jesus. And notice the focus of Simon. Here's where he goes off the rails, starting in verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Just as the miracles done through Philip caught the attention of Simon, so did the pouring out of the Spirit of God. Simon offered the apostles money. He didn't understand. He just simply didn't understand the work of God. Simon wanted to increase his own power. How did they do it? That's what he wanted to know. How'd they do it? The apostles, if you remember, if you look closely at the text, they had prayed in verse 15 for the people to receive the Spirit. But you think Simon was focused on that? He wasn't focused on that at all. Simon wanted to have the power to give people the Spirit of God on demand, almost like a candy vending machine. He just wanted to have that power. Simon was confused. Remember the world. Let's be a little bit fair to him. Remember the world that he was coming from. For a long time, people had been paying him money for the secrets of his magic. He probably thought this was the best way to approach Peter. In typical Peter fashion, notice the clear and bold response that we see in the text. But Peter said to him, your money, I love Peter, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this, your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. How many lies do you think greed has killed? Greed is a destructive force. We think of Judas in Scripture. And Peter understood here, Simon's greed was leading him down this path of destruction. And again, these words here in verse 20, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Sin It leads to death. This should make us think of Ananias and Sapphira back in chapter 5. Peter had told them, he had said to Ananias at the time, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? You see, Simon thought here that he could buy the gift of God. And that's still one of the problems we have today, isn't it? When it comes to the gospel of Christ, people think that they can earn their way to favor with God. And to say in verse 21 that Simon had no part or nor portion in this matter, both words actually refer to inheritance, meaning Simon had no role in the apostolic privilege of granting the baptism of the Holy Spirit to new believers. But allow me to throw this out at you. Look again at the end of verse 21 with me. What does he say? For your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, there's no doubt Peter questioned his motives, but we don't actually see that he gave him the gospel. We don't actually see him question his standing with God. In other words, Peter isn't calling specifically for his salvation. He called him to seek the Lord's forgiveness for sin. Repent of your sin. Come back into fellowship with God. Now, verse 22, I'm not a fan of the words, if perhaps, in the New King James. I think it should be translated like this. Read it. Repent, therefore, of this, your wickedness, and pray, God, if consequently, consequently, that changes things, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. You see, the idea here is that Peter was telling him, repent, pray, maybe the chastening of the Lord would not fall upon him. Seek the Lord's forgiveness. And maybe in his mercy, God will not strike you down like he did with Ananias or Sapphira. Peter told them, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound, bound by iniquity. Simon, he had lost everything that he had built up with his little magic kingdom he made. He had lost his position of prestige. People began to abandon the worship of him for the worship of the Lord. 
That's when bitterness can easily set in. Jealousy over the power of God demonstrated through the apostles. And before you judge him too harshly, remember, there is nothing that he did that you and I are not capable of. His background coming right from interacting with demons and their power every single day makes some of his actions a little easier to understand. Now the question with verse 24 is, did Simon repent? Notice how Simon responded. Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. There's nothing here in the text to suggest that he didn't repent. A lot of people take it that he didn't. But the text, it doesn't tell us that he didn't. Simon feared what the discipline of God may bring. There's no doubt about that. And he simply asked an apostle to pray for him. Verse 25, our last verse, it wraps it all up for us. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. You know, they were supposed to head there right away, weren't they? It took a few years. (laughs) It took a few years. But the apostles were now preaching the gospel of Christ to the Samaritans. D.L. Moody was on a vacation in London. And he had the opportunity to preach for a pastor named Lessie on a Sunday morning. And he was scheduled to speak. D.L. Moody was scheduled to speak again that evening. But the morning service, it was so dead and it was so dry. And the people were so unresponsive that he didn't even really want to go back on that night. But when he walked in on that Sunday evening, the place was absolutely packed. There were more people in the evening service than in the morning service. And it was one of those times where you could just feel the excitement. And as an evangelist, after he got done preaching the gospel, he gave the invitation asking for people to stand if they had responded to the gospel by faith in Jesus Christ. Much to his surprise, dozens stood. He thought... Maybe these people misunderstood him. So he asked them all to just sit back down. And then he asked the people who were serious to meet with him in a separate room after the service so that he could follow up and make sure they clearly were understanding the gospel of Christ. But then dozens more showed up and they lined up down the hallway. Well, Moody could tell that God was working. So he stayed there 10 more days, and over 400 people got saved during that time. Now, Moody, he knew that this type of work of God doesn't just simply happen every single day. So he began to dig a little bit, and he began to investigate a little bit. And he found out that behind the scenes, something had been going on. An elderly woman who had been there for the first service She went home and she told her sister, she told her sister, who happened to be crippled, bedridden, she told her sister that D.L. Moody had been there. And her sister's eyes just ding, 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 lit up like saucers. Because this little old lady, stuck in bed, had been praying that God specifically would send D.L. Moody to England. Put lunch away, she said, because we're going to spend the rest of the afternoon in prayer and fasting. And they did. Two old ladies committed to praying for the salvation of the people of London. And at that point, hundreds, hundreds of lives were changed. Do you know what I see in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts, I see these type of prayers mentioned very often. Pray. Pray for this church specifically. Pray that we're going to grow bolder in our faith. Pray for God to draw people to himself. Pray that we're ready. That we're ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within. Charles Spurgeon once said, I love this quote so much. He once said, I have no other secret than this. I have preached the gospel. Not about the gospel, but I have preached the gospel, the full, free, glorious gospel of the living Christ. And then he admonished, preach Christ, brethren, always and everywhere. Preach Christ. Walk away from Acts this morning, understanding that there's a battle taking place. And this battle is absolutely real. Walk away from Scripture knowing that Satan can and will use anything and everything he can to keep us distracted from the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
He will use greed like he did with Simon. He will use the pride of men. He will use divisive personalities to keep Christians stunted in their faith and stunted in their service to Christ. Simon believed that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is something that can be used to bring attention and glory to ourselves. But the gifts of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, is to be used by believers to bring glory to Almighty God. So join me now as we make it our prayer to become centered on His glory, to become centered on His work, praying for the gospel of Christ to be proclaimed, praying for God to use us to teach a lost and desperate dying world about the glorious salvation in Christ so freely given. Before we close out, I want to thank you for listening. And if you want to keep current with our studies, there's a lot of ways to make sure that you never miss another episode. You can subscribe by email. You can get our free app for your tablet or phone. You can also use the Apple Podcast app or one of the Android apps and have all of the episodes delivered right to your mobile device. You can find all of the links on our webpage, returntotheword.com, underneath the podcast tab. And if you have a minute, help us out by sharing this episode on Twitter or Facebook, because by telling others, you help us to tell the world of God's amazing grace. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879-259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening. And we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.